Welcome everyone to the Fermentation Association's webinar of Fermentation as Metaphor, a conversation. I'm Amelia Nielsen Stoll, editor of TFA. We are a trade group that was launched to support producers who use fermentation to create delicious and often healthful food and beverages. Our goals are to help educate consumers about fermentation and its benefits, support scientific research into those health benefits, and work with food safety authorities to establish clearer and more appropriate regulations in regards to fermentation. Today, we bring you two great speakers, Sander Katz, fermentation author and educator, and author of the new book, Fermentation as a Metaphor. Sander will be, joining, will be joined by Mara King, fermentation chef and food professional. We have many questions already submitted and reviewed with our speakers. If there are additional topics you'd like to see addressed, please enter them in the chat below and we will try to get to them. We'd also like to, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Lee Kum Ki, the leading manufacturer of Asian sauces and ingredients since 1888. All right, Mara and Sander, I will turn the time over to you. All right, thank you, Amelia. Hey, buddy. Um, hello, everybody, welcome. Thank you for joining us from all around the world. It's so exciting to see all the different names and places pop up and also to see familiar names and places pop up. Um, and hi, I'm, I'm, I'm Sander Katz and we're here today talking about my new book, Fermentation is Metaphor. Um, and, um, uh, uh, you know, part of this book is all sorts of incredible microscopy images. And so because I've learned how to do this and the technology is fun, um, I am going to um, uh, 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 switch up my background. So instead of my, instead of my kitchen, um, let's get, let's get me in a microbial force field. All right. I mean, we are all surrounded by microbes all the time. It's true. It's true. <laughs> now, 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 I'm I'm scaled down. So I'm I'm um, uh, uh, you know I'm 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 with them on the cabbage leaf here. Micro Sandor. Um, so I'm super excited to have this conversation with you today, Sandor. Um, I've enjoyed um, all of the time that I've spent with you over the years as we've gotten to be friends, and. Um, I really enjoyed reading this new book of yours. Um, and to be honest, I actually sat down and I read it all in one sitting. It was a very immersive experience. And I felt like, I mean, I feel like all of your books are very personal, like your, your voice and who you are is very recognizable when you read a book by Sandor Katz. Um, did you, did you feel different writing this book than you did writing your other books? Well, I, I mean, I would say yes and no. I mean, you know, as 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 you've pointed out, I mean, in 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 all of my books, you know, my 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 writing voice is personal, and you know, in addition to whatever you know, sort of practical um, um, you know concepts I'm 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 writing about, um, you know, it's always full of um, you know reflections and 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 musings and observations uh, uh, about the world. So this wasn't altogether different, but I will say that you know this was a more challenging process for me you know, writing about something concrete, um, um, you know, like in order to make koji out of rice, you have to do, you know, A and then B and then C and then D, um, you know, that's, that's, you know, I, I find that to be, uh, you know, a, a much more straightforward, easier style of writing than, you know, writing about ideas that are, um, you know, some, somewhat more abstract. Um, one of the interesting things that I found about this book, Fermentation as Metaphor, is and part of the reason why I, I absorbed it in one sitting, I, I feel is that like um, it sort of presents as a mesh of information. Sort of one um, chapter melds and blends into the next. And I found that the book as a whole was similar or metaphorical in its presentation, like the, the way that the book is present, presented, the way that the book is written, 
feels like a mesh, feels like a, my, a membrane of information. Mm -hmm. And that one, by, by entering into this, this information, one sits within and can travel within. Does that make sense? Okay, well, I love, I, I, I love, I love hearing that. And, you know, and of course, you know, part of, uh, part of the inspiration for the book is this idea of membrane. And, you know, that that's that's largely what sort of, you know, brings together some of the ideas that I'm writing about um, of, of fermentation as metaphor, you know, with the microscopy that accompanies uh, 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 the essay, because, you know, I think that, um, you know, looking at things under high magnification, um, you know, strips away the veneer of a um, uh, uh, sharp dividing lines and the and the idea that like sort of a you know a, a membrane is just um, you know a, a fixed surface that is sort of separating you know what's on one side of it from what's on the other side when under magnification you get to see the complexity of the structures of membranes and that you know every structure is supporting smaller structures and, um, and, 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 and that all the membranes actually are, are, are highly uh, uh, permeable and that there's so much, you know, complexity and nuance to things and that, you know, we, we, we can't really, um, uh, you know, use the idea of sharp dividing lines to, you know, create and reinforce, um, you know, rigid categories. And that seems, yeah, that, that theme was present throughout, like the, the ideas of how th the ways in which we project control on the world around us are generally concepts and ideas designed to protect us in some way or another. And as we start to break these boundaries down, we realize the interconnectivity of everything. But, you know, and, and, and of course, in, um, you know, in, in writing and speaking and teaching about fermentation for, for, for all these years, I feel like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly encountering, you know, people projecting these, um, you know, sort of concepts onto the idea of fermentation. So like, okay, here's a little, here's a little jar. Uh, oh, it's, it's, it's sort of blending in with its uh, uh, background, but here's a little jar. Oh, <laughs> A little jar of um, um, kraut that I made made the other week, but you know I'll say a thousand times in the last you know 17 years that I've been teaching about fermentation, you know I've encountered the question, you know how can I be sure that I have good bacteria growing in my jar of, of cabbages and not something you know that 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 might make me sick or even kill somebody, you know what do you mean I don't have to sterilize the jar? Doesn't that mean that something um, uh, you know something could contaminate it? So, you know, all of these concepts around, you know, purity and contamination, which, which really are, you know, abstractions. I mean, there is no purity. There's always contamination, um, um, you know, just informs so much of, uh, uh, you know, how we, we, we think about these things. And it actually makes these processes that have been, um, you, you know, sort of a, a part of human culture for uh, 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 you know, for forever, um, really alien to people because you know they're projecting all of this fear that we've been taught to have in recent times, you know, onto these ancient processes that really are you know safe and um, uh, uh, tested by time. A um, couple of ideas I want to share with you. So first of all, this is a this is a book that I've read many times, and it was beat up before. Um, I even got it. This book belonged to my father. This is, uh, it's Man and His Symbols by, by Carl Jung. And um, it has essays written by Carl Jung and other um, people who are, um, you know, scholars on psychology and they're looking at myth and symbolism and humanity, the unconscious and um, the modern man. And um, one of the things that really stood out to me um, was how, um, you know, Jung and Freud had been looking at how human or modern um, humans fall into these, um, they fall into these places because they reach, you know, they, they have some kind of dissonance between their natural selves and their psyches. So the world and the concepts that they have 
are at odds with, you know, what's actually going on within them, their natures and their drives. I'm going to read a tiny little bit here. Um, Man likes to believe that he's the master of his soul, but as long as he is unable to control his moods and emotions or to be conscious of the myriad secret ways in which unconscious factors insinuate themselves into his arrangements and decisions, he is certainly not his own master. These unconscious factors owe their existence to the autonomy of the archetypes. Modern man protects himself against seeing his own split state by a system of compartments. Certain areas of outer life and his own behavior are kept, as it were, in separate drawers and are never confronted with one another. So this, this struck me as being really relevant. You know, we see part of what you're doing in this book is sort of like breaking down these barriers, these ideas of like, this is pure, this is clean, this is racially pure, this is female, this is male. Um, and, you know, I feel like this is a process for each individual to um, embark upon, to learn about oneself and then learn about how to approach the world as oneself. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I would agree that it's a it's a process that individuals have to go through, but you know, also over time, um, um, you know, social perceptions of these categories uh, 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 can and 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 do change. So, you know, at, at one level, it's like you know, um, um, you know, journeys that individual people go through on their own, but on another level. Um, you know, when a lot of people are going through similar processes simultaneously, um, um, you know, then it sort of, you know, builds into a, a, a larger, a larger um, a, a, a social uh, uh, process. But I would agree. I mean, this concept of compartmentalization is, you know, very, you know, is very similar to this idea of like rigid categories with, you know, sharp dividing lines. And, um, and in terms of the unconscious, I mean, you know, one of the things that I'll say about the, you know, the practice of fermentation is, you know, it puts you in touch with invisible life forces and, you know, invisible life forces, uh, 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 you know, are, you know, um, um, you know, related to, um, you know, unconscious um, um, influences. I mean, in the past, um, there have been instances of fermentation being in the realm of shamans, you know, the, the, the man with the magic stick or the woman with the magic stick that would stir the mead and then the mead would start bubbling. That was like the, uh, the you know, the holy person, I guess that's kind of a, 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 a simple example, but I'm sure that there are lots of examples throughout history, human history of this mysticism that is attached to the process of fermentation. Uh, hi. I'm on, I'm on, sweetie. Can you go ask daddy? He's downstairs. Thanks, honey. Well, and I, and I would say that, that there continues to be a, a, a magic to fermentation and, you know, maybe in some ways even more so, um, you know, as fewer uh, uh, people have direct contact with it. So, you know, as there's less, you know, wine making, cheese making, um, 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 you know, all, all realms of baking, uh, uh, you know, in our lives that, that people actually see, these processes become more and more mysterious and, you know, probably for some people, you know, magical transformations. But, but I think that this has always been an aspect of, 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 of fermentation because, um, you know, they're, they're, they're really never, uh, you know, until very recent times was sort of a clear, um, you know, uh, a, a rational scientific understanding of what was going on. And so, um, um, you know, these were always seen as sort of divine processes with, as you say, you know, lots of ceremony and uh, a, a ritual uh, attached to them. We've even witnessed that together. Um, you know, I remember when we were um, um, in Chin Fen, this uh, uh, small village in Guizhou, and um, you know, we're 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 watching this woman uh, uh, ferment rice into alcohol, and at the end, she has like her little um, you know little cluster of chili peppers, and she did a little sort of incantation over it, and then rested the chili peppers on 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 on, on top of it. So, I mean, I think that you know, I think in a lot of traditions, you know, the the sort of you know magical um, 
um, aspect of fermentation definitely uh, uh, persists. Um, so I, I am a student of literature and I'm a big fan of myth and horror and science fiction. Um, there is a theory that um, a lot of our modern tropes, our modern myths of horror come from um, industrialization. So for example, like the, the, uh, the vampire or the zombie, they're very like modern, um, like the zombie is a purely modern uh, ghosty, ghouly type thing. And um, the, the disassociation of humans from the natural world, the disassociation and the movement of humans into cities and um, the, you know, the creation of, of uh, modern life have sort of fueled these horror fantasies. Um, and I do, I do see some similarities like reading about um, the, the horrors of, uh, you know, ethnic, you know, horrors of ethnic cleansing, the horrors of um, pure purity and contamination and, you know, the, the disconnectivity that um, a post-industrial modern life le leaves us in. Have you, have you ever had these sort of concepts or ideas, not, not only of like the spirit of fermentation, but like the horrors of the world around us? <laughs> it's kind of a Halloween-y question. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how, 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 how to answer that, 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 that question. I mean, sure. I mean, I think that, I, 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 you know, I mean, in so many ways, I have, um, you know, I have lived this, this blessed life, this, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I honestly have not had like a nine to five job, um, you know, since 1993. Um, and so, you know, I sort of, I dropped out of that, I moved to this commune. Um, and it's sort of in that context that I got interested in, in fermentation, but, you know, certainly like, you know, living the unstructured life uh, uh, that I was able to live um, you know, in, in the commune and, uh, and, 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 and since, um, you know, I mean, contrasts sharply with like, you know, some people I know who, you know, go every day to the Amazon warehouse and, and, you know, sort of like, you know, run around the Amazon warehouse trying to fill orders, uh, um, 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 you know, and, and, and reach their quota. I mean, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, um, you know, there's a lot of people stuck in, um, you know, kind of, you know, joyless, soul-sucking routines um, um, in our world. And so, you know, I mean, I, I certainly see the connection between like industrialization and, you know, the creation of factories, you know, and this like, you know, like zombie idea for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like this, there's there's definitely something behind what's driving us to reconnect with the natural world. And I, I personally feel like fermentation is such an amazing firsthand way to participate in nature. And you can do it whether you live in a city high rise or if you live in a, um, you know, in a, on a farm. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. I mean, for me, that's been one of the most, um, you know, powerful things about my relationship to, to fermentation is it's just sort of forced me to pay so much more attention to the, to the, to the natural world. And, you know, notice all kinds of, uh, you know, phenomena that I, that, that I hadn't noticed before. Um, and I think that it's a, you know, it's a, it's, it's a great way of, you know, refocusing uh, 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 people's attention. And I mean, it's not to say that, you know, people shouldn't also focus their attention on, on, you know, on, on, on other things that are more of a, you know, human creation or, or more like, uh, um, you know, part of our social or cultural world. But it's really, you know, it's, it's important, it's profound to focus some of our attention on, you know, natural phenomenon and the, you know, the, the other kinds of organisms that we're sharing the world with. Um, okay, just a couple of bits from the actual book that I wanna delve a little further into. Um, one, one of the parts of the book that um, triggered me a little was your um, section on body odor. Um, so I, you, you wrote, quote, 
I am a hairy, sweaty man. And then continue right now, yeah. end quote. <laughs> and then and continue to go on about your experience with your mom and how she sort of shamed you a little bit about body odor and how you didn't like to use um, deodorants. And I immediately felt like a bad mom because I have a teenage son and I have harassed him about the smell emanating from his room more than once. And then I just was like, okay, I got to take this in and think about, okay, how would it feel to be my son and to be, you know, berated in that way? Um, but I did, it, even though it triggered me, I really enjoyed that. It, it is another example within this book of sort of embracing who we are where we come from and, you know, on our own terms as well and in, on, in natural terms. Yeah, well, and I mean, I think that, you know, the, I mean, the smell of things is a, it's a, it's a huge aspect of fermentation. I mean, I don't think a month has gone by in 15 years where I didn't get an email that was like, you know, what do you do about the terrible smell of sauerkraut and kimchi? Um, you know, how do you deal with this? How do you, you know, how do you maintain your, your household? Um, you know, what do you do with this smell? And so, I, you know, I mean, for me, it's been easy because like, I love that smell. And like, I, I mean, I don't find it off-putting at all. Um, you know, thankfully I haven't had to share living space with anybody who, you know, sort of felt like that was an awful smell. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just as with tastes, you know, our idea of what smells good and what smells bad is not necessarily, um, you know, a, um, um, uh, um, you know, a, a fixed thing. It's a lot about, you know, what, what we've been told. So, you know, we've been told that the way human bodies smell is bad. And, um, you know, there's this huge industry, like there's all these products that you have to buy to prevent your body from smelling the way it naturally smells or to cover up the smells that, 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 that it produces. And, um, um, you know, and the, the, the same thing in our homes, like, you know, I, I, you know, I mean, people having little, you know, aerosol floral sprays in their, in their bathroom. So after you use the toilet, you know, you spray a little, you know, artificial floral aroma to, 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 to cover up, you know, the, 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 the smell that, you know, we each produce in the course of our, um, you know, normal healthy existence. Um, you know, I, I guess what I would say is we have pathologized mm -hmm. our healthy state. But I feel like that bleeds a little bit into how we pathologize one another. So, I mean, I have actually been the recipient of racist remarks against my culture's food. Um, when I went to school with kids from all over the world, you know, there would be like curling of the nose and um, shaming of, you know, the stinky things that, that we would eat. And if we go to certain villages in, in the countryside, like the, the powerful aroma of fermenting uh, shellfish and fermenting or drying fish. Um, and then the wet markets um, from, uh, I, from China, where I grew up, um, where it was all like, um, it was so visceral. There were literally like guts on the ground around the fishmongers and chicken blood in the drains. And, you know, I got to tell you, none of those smells are awesome. The, the market has its own sort of like very, um, very vital and, and slightly horrible uh, um, wang to it. Um, but uh, I feel like we don't realize by turning our noses up at one another's cultures that we can be really harmful as well. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. I mean, the story, the story you're telling is one that I've just heard, you know, so many, so many times of, you know, um, um, you know, kids who through their, you know, interactions at school started sort of feeling bad about, you know, the like the food of their ancestry that their family was sending to school with them because other kids would, you know, would, 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 would make faces at it. And, um, you know, definitely like smell is this, um, you know, um, uh, you know, sort of, um, um, you know, this important sense that we have. But, you know, I, I guess my feeling is like, it's an important sense for us to use if we're always covering everything up with like these fake 
floral uh, 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 scents, then we're really depriving ourselves of, you know, an important scent that we have to use. And, you know, one of, one of my like sort of, you know, just biggest ridiculous pet peeves is, you know, the first time I bought um, trash bags that were pre-scented. Um, um, and, you know, it's like, I guess I want to know if the, if the trash in my kitchen is starting to smell like that's important for me to know, because that means I want to take the bag outside. I don't want it to be covered up with artificial floral smell. So I don't, I don't even know. Um, so, I mean, I just feel like, you know, in the practice of fermentation, in, um, uh, you know, sort of so many aspects of, uh, of, of life, just in, in cleaning the kitchen, um, you know, I, 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 want, I, I want to be able to use uh, the, 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 the power of my smell. Um, and I feel like, you know, sort of the more, you know, the more I'm around people who are, you know, spritzing cologne and um, perfume uh, uh, on and I'm environments that are artificially scented, you know, the less, um, um, you know, acute my sense of smell becomes. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, and I, I want to, I want to, you know, I want to really use that. I feel like fermentation is really teaching the world to embrace weird and funky things. I'm I take natural wines as an example. There's a big movement in the world of winemaking for using older techniques, um, using less sort of chemical filtration and clarification methods. Um, and what you're left with is a product that changes from year to year and a product that has, you know, like subtle notes of animal or leather or things that you wouldn't find before and we're realizing that a little bit of horrible is actually quite wonderful. Yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely no. I'm I'm way into natural wines, and I also like to, you know, when I hear people talk about natural wines as a, you know, sort of a, like a new cutting edge movement in wine, you know, well, I like to really remind people that you know all wine until like the very end of the 19th century was natural wine. Like that's just all wine was made just re relying on wild fermentation from the um, uh, uh, organisms on the, on the skins of the grapes and our ability to sort of um, um, destroy all of that and just put in a pure yeast is, is a you know, relatively recent technological uh, uh, innovation. And, and the same with beers. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, um, last year I was visiting my, my father in upstate New York and um, we stopped by a beer store and uh, there was a really uh, um, um, a sour beer that I like a lot and I bought, I bought some of it. And first of all, he couldn't believe how much I was willing to spend on, on um, a, a four pack of beer. But then, you know, that evening he wanted to taste it and, uh, and he tasted it and he just made this horrible face like how could you, you're not only buying that but you're you're not only drinking that but you're paying more for it and he just thought that was horrible but I, I don't know like to me it's just like so much more interesting and complex of a flavor than you know the um you know like the 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 the, the mass produced beer where you know just a single or organism is introduced but but I agree with you that like you, you know um um you know fer fermentation really um, you know, encourages people to um, expand their palates. And, um, you know, like nobody's born loving Roquefort cheese, but like lots of people by, you know, sort of enjoying cheese in general and, and expanding the range of what kinds of cheeses they're willing to, to, to taste come to love that flavor. And I think, you know, every realm of fermentation, I mean, you know, it was when I was with you, in China that I really had like, you know, some of my first tastes of, um, you know, fermented tofu, uh, 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 furu. So, you know, this is something that I've been playing with in, oh, okay, I better take, I better take off my, um, my novelty screen because it doesn't work well with, um, um, um show and tell, <laughs> show and tell, um, okay, there, there we are. So um, um, I've been doing this, um, uh, this uh, I made in, in, in August, um, but like, I mean, I think that, you know, f funk is, funk is good. Funk makes things interesting. F funk is complexity. Um, and uh, I don't know what I've learned, you know, by, you know, um, um, you know, uh, working with fermented tofu 
uh, uh, in food, working with NATO in food, uh, uh, working with Sumbala, the sort of West African condiments that are that are NATO like. Working with fish sauce is like a little bit of something that on its own, a lot of might taste awful to you. A little bit of it can introduce this uh, je ne sais quoi, uh, uh, you know, into the flavor of, 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 of a dish. And, you know, and, and, and complexity is, 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 is good. And, and even flavors that on their own, people might find, um, uh, um, you know, scary or, or intimidating. Yeah, absolutely. Um, hey, I wanted to talk also about one other thing that really struck me in this book, which really resonated, and that was emotional composting. Um, I really love that term. Um, will you explain to everybody who's listening who might not have read the book yet, what is emotional composting? Sure. So, um, I, I mean, I learned this phrase, emotional composting, from um, an old friend of mine, uh, uh, Valencia. And, um, you know, she, she would just always talk about, you know, that you can't, you know, you can't deny your emotions, you can't ignore your emotions, but you also can't let, you know, your emotions, um, 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 you know, define you. And that you have to be fluid in your emotions and sort of, and, and th this metaphor that she always used, and it turns out she didn't make it up. She got it from this um, uh, um, um, Taoist thinker, Montak Chia. Um, but the idea is that just like on a compost pile where, you know, your vegetable scraps and weeds and whatever else you put in there, you know, br break down and, and, and become new forms that we can, you know, visualize the same kind of process with our emotions. And so, you know, if we're feeling, you know, if we're feeling anger, if we're feeling self-doubt, um, you know, instead of denying them, you know, we can, we can sort of like accept that their feelings and you know, and, and, and allow for their transformation into, um, you know, feelings that, you know, can, can, can propel us forward. So, you know, it's really, uh, I, I mean, it, and, and of course, compost is a manifestation of fermentation, the transformative action of microorganisms. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, I just, you know, the reason I've written this book is that I think that, you know, in addition to being this important, um, uh, uh, you know, phenomenon that, that um, uh, you know, is part of how people everywhere make effective use of food resources that are available to them, fermentation is a very uh, powerful and um, um, uh, widely applicable uh, uh, metaphor. Um, and, um, and, and certainly in the realm of our emotions, I think that, you know, fermentation or, or the variant of it that we call composting is just a great way to think about, you know, what do we do with, you know, emotions that we recognize are not serving us well. Mm. Yeah, I really dug that. Oh, and then I forgot, I actually forgot what I was going to say to finish off your little furu uh, demonstration. I'm so sad that we didn't, we are not going to China in a month because- We were supposed to be going so, to, to Taiwan and China in November, very sad. I was really sad because your next level of stinky tofu um, is, is chou dofu, which is like, if you think furu is stinky, chou dofu is like being slapped in the face by the stink gods. And it is, you know, once you get the, once you, it's sort of like Limburger, like once you get the taste for it, you kind of go a little nuts over it. Well, that's also what's happened to me with, um, with, with natto. You know, I mean, the first, the first time I tried natto, I definitely, you know, did not say, oh, this is delicious. Um, um, you know, where can I find more of it? Like the first time I was very, I was very put off by it. And, you know, it was only, you know, I've thought a lot about this idea of how we acquire taste because, you know, many, many fermented foods are what we could describe as, as acquired taste. But, you know, it really took, um, um, you know, um, uh, uh, Bill Shirtliff, the author of the book of Miso, you know, writing me an email after he saw Wild Fermentation and saying, well, that's a, it's, it's a really good book, but, um, you know, there's a few glaring omissions, uh, uh, including Natto. Um, and then Betty Steckmeyer, the 
founder of um, uh, uh, Gem Cultures. Um, um, she showed me how to make natto. She showed me her tricks for how she hides natto in food so people don't even realize it's there. And I would say that, you know, eating a little bit of natto in that context, um, you know, helped me, um, you know, accept the, 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 the flavor of it in a way that like, you know, then later I was like, why would you ever want to hide this flavor? You want to, you want to highlight this flavor. You want to embrace this flavor. Um, but, 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 um, um, you know, I really, like, I've learned to, I've learned to, to, to love natto and just, just to show everybody, one of the things I do with natto, um, um, I did for the first time with, when Mara was visiting and we dehydrate the natto, mix it with, um, um, uh, uh, toasted sesame seeds, grind them up together. In this case, with um, Sichuan uh, uh, peppercorns and uh, um, uh, uh, chili pepper, but I've also been trying it with with different kinds of seasonings, and um, it's just like a natural base for like any kind of seasoning uh, 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 mix. Like so good on any kind of uh, uh, savory food. But you know, we can. My kids love it. You know, our My kids tastes love it. are. Our tastes are not fixed. You know, we are we are incredibly lucky, versatile omnivores. And um, you know, just because we didn't learn to love something when we were little kids, because our 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 parents, you know, didn't love those foods, doesn't mean we can't learn to love them. But uh, but you know, my feeling is that like you have to witness somebody taking great pleasure in it, like to 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 even have the idea that you would want to try to learn to. Learn. To, to, to enjoy something. Um, let's turn the conversation to food. Um, what is your favorite ferment right now? What is inspiring you in your kitchen? Well, okay, I, I, I mean, I'm terrible on the on the, the, the favorite ferment um, um, because, you know, I, I like versatility, but one, you know, one thing that's been going on in my life and actually it's just ending now. Like today, we only found one chestnut. Ooh. But um, uh, for the last month, every day, we've been going outside. I have three chestnut trees outside of my house and just collecting the chestnuts that have fallen since the day before. And, um, you know, we've been eating some fresh, um, you know, roasting, uh, uh, cutting them up, putting them in stir fries or whatever. Um, but I, turned a bunch into koji. I made chestnut koji. And so this is a jar of chestnut shio koji. Um, and then I have a crock over here of uh, chestnut koji miso. Um, and then the rest of it, we're just, we're just drying and then turning it into like a crumble. Um, um, that, 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 that we'll use in, 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 in cooking all year around. So, you know, right in this moment, I'm very, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very much focused on, on the chestnuts. Um, in my garden right now, the daikon radishes are getting like nice and fat. And, um, you know, that'll, that'll be the next thing is um, I'm fermenting daikons. And do you hang them to dry first? Well, I, I do different things. So first, I, I'm just going to show off. This is the this is year old fermented daikons. This is the last of what was um, 200 liters, and so now I have like probably three liters uh, 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 of, of, of it left. But so some of it I just slice and do like you know um, uh, dry salting sauerkraut style. Um, of the, you know, daikons, maybe I'll throw a few cabbages in there, um, um, salt them and do that. But then also I'll, I always do some in the, um, 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 oh God, I'm blanking on the name, um, um, the beautiful- uh, Taquan? Taquan, yeah, yeah, yeah. So those, I mean, I mean, I love that process of like, drying the radishes with the tops on them and rolling them every day to distribute the moisture within the um, uh, 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 radish. And then they become these nice, like pliable uh, 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 things as, as they dry out um, um, and then fermenting them with some um, rice bran and, and, and salt. No, I love, I love that process. I definitely do some of them that way. Awesome. Um, there and then, and then I, I've also, let, let me just also just mention for one yeah. second that 
I have, I've, I've actually, I mean, so this is my book that's out right now. I finished writing this like right before the pandemic. I, I mean, I did a little bit of editing to sort of acknowledge the, the pandemic because it seemed thematic. Um, but, um, but, but really since, I, since all of my travels got canceled and I've been at home, I've been working on another book, which is really a fermentation travelogue book. And so I've been doing a lot of, you know, playing around with things that I learned about in my travels. And, you know, one thing that I've gotten obsessed with in the last couple of months and I don't have at this moment is um, a South American approach to fermenting cassava called yuca podrida. Uh, and that translates to, to basically rotten cassava. Um, but it's not rotten at all. It's just, you know, it's just delicious. And the, you know, the fermentation, like in so many cases with cassava, the fermentation takes this like neutral, plain food and gives it uh, like a really discernible, um, compelling flavor. Um, uh, and then, and then I basically make these little tortillas with it, but generally with some sauteed vegetable and cheese layer in the middle. So it's like a, you know, a, like almost like a grilled cheese and vegetable, um, a, a, a tortilla. So I've, I've, I've been loving that and, um, uh, developing recipe, which will be in my book coming out about a year from now. So your, your new book is, um, uh, book about traveling and will include recipes? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, it's a fermentation book, but it's a, it's really about, you know, fer fermentation processes that I learned about in my travels. Um, um, you know, because there's been such widespread interest in fermentation, I mean, I've just been lucky enough to, you know, have taught in about 25 countries at this point. And then, you know, like when we went together to China, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to travel to a handful of other places where I wasn't specifically invited to, uh, 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 to teach. Um, yeah. Hi, Amelia. Okay. Hello, Amelia, are you guys... Yeah. Uh, Are you guys ready we're, for some we're, audience we're questions? Through our, our, our questions, yeah. Yes. Okay, first, I am curious. You guys have mentioned your travels to China. I don't know if everyone knows who's listening, but uh, Sander and Mara actually did a really fascinating video series you can find on YouTube called People's Republic of Fermentation. And it kind of detailed um, the fermentation traditions of Southwest China. Very interesting video series. Okay, if you two could do this again, explore fermentation traditions from another country, where would you go? We were actually planning to leave next month to go to Taiwan and the eastern seaboard of China um, to look further into different Chinese fermentation techniques. But Sandor, I'm sure you have some other um, places that you really would love to go. Well, sure. No, I'm, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I definitely want to go back to China. Like I've spent a total of like about two weeks of my life in China. Like I love Chinese food. I feel like I've just like scratched the surface of it and I would love um, the opportunity to visit some other regions of China for sure. I'd love to go to Korea. I've never been to Korea, which has, you know, such incredible uh, uh, fermentation traditions. I visited Japan, but I only spent a short time there and I'd love to spend more time in Japan. I'd love to go to West Africa. I'm very, very interested in um, these fermented condiments that are used throughout West Africa. Um, and uh, I'd love to learn more about that. I, I mean, basically at this point, like, I, I, I just feel like there's such interesting fermentations everywhere that there's nowhere where I wouldn't be interested in going. Actually, a year ago, I met this amazing woman from Greenland who is a microbiologist. Um, and she has been, you know, studying the microbiology of the traditional ferments of the people of Greenland. And, um, um, uh, you know, I'm hoping at some point in the coming years that I'll get to go and, uh, and, and, and visit her and, um, you know, experience some of the uh, uh, ferments in that far northern place. So, I, I mean, there's not one singular destination. I mean, I just think fermentation is such a fascinating lens through which to look at the world and, you know, and the incredible, um, you know, um, um, practicality of, um, you know, of, of traditional cultural wisdom. 
Uh, so how, another question for both of you. I know Mara has spoken about this a few times. How do we respect and honor other cultures when using their fermentation knowledge and lineage? Um, always be a student and don't be a master. Oh yeah, that, 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 that's a great way to put it. I mean, I think, you know, we just have to, yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't think that there's anything wrong with like taking inspiration from, you know, traditional practices. I mean, that's what all fermentation practices are. I mean, nobody's invented any new fermentation, you know, practices in hundreds and possibly thousands of years, but, you, you know, all, all the innovation comes from, you know, uh, uh, people taking something that's traditional, you know, apply uh, traditionally applied to, you know, some uh, uh, ingredient or set of ingredients, and then playing around with applying it to uh, uh, other ingredients or or, or, or sets of, of of ingredients. But I, I I think that you know it's always important to you know acknowledge where the technique came from, where the inspiration came from. Um, and, um, you know, the worst thing anyone can ever do is try to pass it off as like, as, as, as their own um, um, invention. And I think we always have to listen, you, you know, we, we, we always have to be open to listening to other people's perceptions. I mean, you know, um, um, you know, cultural appropriation has very little to do with the intention of the person who's doing it and has a lot to do with the perception of the person who's seeing it. And so I just think it's important to always remain open to, um, you know, hearing how, you know, your interpretation of someone else's tradition might make them feel. And um, sometimes it might make them feel really good. And sometimes it might make them feel like something has been taken from them. All right, so we received a different iteration of this question so many times. People want to know, Sander, how, uh, what fermentation microbe in your research uh, best describes our current political, health, social injustice climate that we find ourselves in today? And can the microbial world help bring balance back? Well, I mean, I don't think that See, the microbial world is not about singular organisms. So, you know, there's no one organism that can, you know, sort of represent, you know, let's say, you know, sort of like conflicts that are that are that are happening in our contemporary world between different people or or different groups of people. Um, um, because you know, it's only in a you know in a, in an extremely contrived environment that humans have figured out how to create that you could ever have singular microorganisms. And the reality is that once you have groups of microorganisms, you know, they're, they're always shifting. They're always exchanging genetic material. They're always, you know, trading identities to, 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 to some degree. So it's like, you know, they're not even this like set of fixed actors. They're this very, um, you know, fluid set of actors. And I, I suppose, you know, what, what I would say is that, you know, we can, um, you know, we can take some inspiration from that and we can become, you know, more, more fluid in our interactions, less rigid in, you know, sort of how we view ourselves, how we view um, 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 other people. That's something I really came away from reading this book was that you're not offering any answers. You're not telling people how to think. You're just shifting the perspective you know, open, open up the limitations between us and maybe think about the world in a different way. And you might feel a little bit more vulnerable doing so. Um, you might feel a little vulnerable not knowing that there's no one answer, no one uh, step to follow that will save us all. Um, but being part of the process and being part of humanity and being part of nature, you know, you're one among many. Thank you. Beautiful answers, both of you. Okay, tell me a bit about uh, fermentation as a means for sustainability. We received a lot of these questions too. People curious about um, how to solve America's food waste problem, which we know is not great. <laughs> America does have a bad food waste problem. Do you have insight into how we can reduce food loss through fermentation? Well, sure. I, I mean, I think you definitely can reduce food loss through fermentation, but you know, it's, it's not like you can just take 
the food system that we have now and sort of solve the problems of it by, you know, sort of fermenting the, you know, the, the, the waste that, 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 that's generated. I mean, you know, fermentation emerged everywhere as a, um, like a, a, a practical aspect of how people make effective use of the food resources that are available to them. And so in some cases that has to do with preservation you take the vegetables that are abundant at a certain time of the year. You take the milk that's, you know, perhaps the most perishable of all food resources, and you use fermentation as a means to turn those highly perishable foods into more stable foods that, that we can enjoy and eat over longer periods of time. You take the foods that are have some toxic compound and ferment them to remove the toxicity. You take the food like a soybean that's difficult to digest and you, you, you make the nutrients more bioavailable and um, you know, make the whole thing more digestible through the fermentation. But you know, this all assumes that you're engaged in... Um, um, you know, in, in, in producing or procuring those food resources. So, you know, you're walking through the forest and, 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 you know, checking out the available fruit. You're, you know, tending the fields and in touch with like the seasons and, and the harvest time. And so, you, you know, in the context of like none of that, but just, you know, food being purely a consumer experience that we like go to the supermarket, we buy what, what we need and, you know, influenced by what's on sale and we, and it's all heavily packaged and we bring it home and open up the, and have this garbage pail full of, of uh, uh, plastic and, you know, and then we cook what we might and then, you know, then we have some leftovers and we, we're looking for fermentation and fermentation for what to do with the leftovers i mean i think you know sustainability just has to be you know moving away from the processed and heavily packaged foods and um you know i'm not saying everybody has to become a hunter gatherer or that everybody has to feed themselves out of a garden um but that you know we just we 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 need to sort of move away from this model of centralized food production and uh, at least re-regionalize, re-localize food production. So we need more people to be engaged in producing food, um, um, but we also need for just every local area to, um, you know, increase their produ productive capacity for producing food. And I, you know, I think that, you know, I, I, COVID has been a small example of this, but, you know, really like the only food security is decentralized food production. And I think in the context of more decentralized food production that, um, you know, fermentation can play a much more critical role in, um, you know, making that sustainable. So like, you know, Mara's in Colorado. If you're in a place like Colorado that has a very limited growing season, then, you know, processes like fermentation are, are essential for taking what you can produce um, um, and feeding people throughout the whole, whole year with that. Now, in terms of the specific question of, of food waste, um, you know, I, I mean, I would say, um, I, I mean, from, I've seen fermentation applied in like so many interesting ways. I mean, in fact, um, a year and a half ago, I was in Switzerland and I met this guy who was working with restaurants and he was making uh, uh, fermented condiments, you know, soy sauce like condiments, amino sauces, um, um, as they would be called in the Koji Alchemy book. But, you know, he would work with, a, let's say, one restaurant was saving all the ends of celery and the peels of celery root. And then they'd give them to him and he'd mix that with koji and salt and make them a, uh, you know, a celery, um, uh, like, you know, a, a, a celery condiment, uh, like a, um, um, a, you know, a fermented uh, um, 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 uh, 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 condiment with it. So, I mean, that, that's one, one way it can go. You know, the other can be just be like, um, um, you know, turning 
extra. I, I visited a, a, a restaurant in the UK that was open on weekends. And, um, you know, on Sunday night, their, their chant was 2% salt, whatever vegetables they had prepped beyond what they, what they needed, they would just mix them with 2% salt and then essentially make a mixed vegetable uh, 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 sauerkraut out of it. So I think that there's lots of, you know, specific small ways that we can apply fermentation to, um, um, you know, re reduce food waste. But I, but I think, you know, really, if we want to talk about sustainability in food, it's much more about, you know, where's our food coming from and you know how can we you know sort of support the decentralization of food production i absolutely agree with you sandor i mean from my own personal experience having run a um sauerkraut business a sauerkraut and kimchi business and um you know dealing with venture capitalists and people who have visions for growing businesses it was such an unsustainable thing to try and grow a fermentation business in the US um, in terms of like the only, you have to get to a certain size to be able to compete and play in this sort of national marketplace. And, you know, if you're getting to that sort of size, are you really like running a sustainable business at the end of the day? Um, the idea of making, instead of participating on these in these large scale national like or international businesses, like perhaps it's better to engage in the community on a smaller scale, you know, engage the people in your community that are making ferments, who are doing cool things with food waste um, and, and be a part of the change and, and get involved in your government as well and um, get money diverted into your local food, um, like building local food resources and local food systems that work. And I just want to say one other thing that I've been, that I've been thinking about a lot and especially like in, in um, uh, um, working on this new sort of fermentation travelogue book that I've been working on, but you know, just, you know, small scale processing. I mean, I think that, you know, economically we have convinced ourselves that, you know, certain kinds of food processing, you know, just only make sense um, uh, at a large um, um, uh, uh, centralized scale. But like, you know, when Mara and I were together, um, uh, you know, at a market in a tiny village in Sichuan, um, you know, I had the best vegetable oil I've ever had in my life. And it was this little shop and we could smell the roasting, the, 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 the roasted rapeseed oil from outside and the smell, you know, brought us into the shop. And it was just this, you know, this, 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 this tiny press that couldn't have pressed more than a couple of gallons of, of um, oil an hour. And it was but in this the village, village that everybody in the village brings their seeds there to that one processing spot. And I've seen similar things like in, I've, in a town in Mexico, I visited the town mill where people would nixtamalize their corn and then bring it to the mill to have it to have it processed. I mean, the only choices are not like us doing everything a, 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 ourselves at home. You know, me trying to do that with a mortar and pestle or or, or something versus, um, you know, a, like a huge factory a thousand miles away. I mean, there's a lot of intermediate scale um, um, food processing that could, enable, first of all, produce local jobs, but also maybe more importantly, enable us to have more delicious food and more nutritious food because that's what that, that's what fresher food is. It's more delicious and, 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 and more nutritious. So, you know, I, I mean, beyond fermentation, I would love to see mills and oil pressing and, you know, other kinds of things that really don't take rocket science technology that we could, you know, we, we, we could have in, you know, in every small town. Um, um, but the problem is, of course, that that's more expensive than, you know, doing it in huge centralized facilities. But, you know, if, um, um, you know, I mean, with government support, recognizing that it produces, you know, more, more, more nutritious and delicious food, as well as produces jobs, you know, this, this could happen. And also if people felt like, you know, they were willing to put more of their money into a uh, 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 food, you know, that's also what it takes to sort of support, um, you know, more decentralized food processing. 
the the Grange system in the United States of America is interesting. Um, you know, I live in I live in the West or the Midwest to the West of the United States, and there are like sort of um, these little granges throughout the plains here in Colorado, where people who used to farm the land and um, uh, raise cattle on the land would meet together and process food together. I think that this concept of having um, little little processing pods um, where people can store food, process food, and even like have access to media to share ideas about food would be such a valuable thing in any in any community. Okay, my last question for both of you: Where do you see fermentation in five, ten years from now? What's it What's it going to look like? Will we see more of the same traditions, or is there space for innovation? Well, I mean, I think that there's always space for innovation, and I mean, I mean, I would say that the history, the long history of fermentation is a history of innovation. I mean, it's not like people, you know, of like up until Louis Pasteur, all people in all places just did the same things that they saw their grandparents doing. I mean, I think that there's, you know, there's always been innovation. I mean, you know, um, 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 I look at, um, I look at ceramic crocs and I have a nice collection of them, um, but, you know, I, I mean, you know, we have this idea that the, the earliest example of fermentation is on pottery shards from China from 10,000 years ago. That just tells us about the history of pottery. It doesn't really tell us about the history of fermentation because the earlier fermentation vessels were, you know, hollowed out pieces of wood or they were animal skins or they were gourds or, you know, they were other, you know, biological and biodegradable um, 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 objects. And, and so, you know, it, at some point people figured out that when you take clay from the earth and you heat it, it becomes stable and it can hold liquids. And, um, and so, you know, that's technical innovation from 10,000 years ago that spread all around the world, the idea of how you make pottery vessels. And, you know, I, I mean, I just think that, um, um, you know, I mean, pe pe I mean, people can't help themselves, like people will just continue to innovate. And I think that, you know, because so many more people have become, I mean, everyone in the world eats and drinks products of fermentation every day. You know, that's true of our parents, that's true of our grandparents, that's true of our great grandparents. But for a couple of generations, you know, most of us have not been thinking about it. And so as more people are thinking about it, as more people are aware of it, as more people are experimenting with it in their kitchens, I mean, it's inevitable that people will continue to innovate. And that, um, you, you know, I mean, one of the most innovative books to my mind is uh, uh, Koji Alchemy. And, um, so in, in that book that, you know, the, the, the authors have taken this sort of like this ancient process, you know, it's called Koji in Japan, but, um, um, you know, it's maybe even more ancient in, in China and it's also practiced in Korea and it's also practiced in India and, and, and really like all, all across Asia, the idea of, you know, and, well, and actually somebody just sent me um, um, a, a scholarly article uh, that in the Amazon in Brazil, there's evidence of people growing molds on cassava to process it. So maybe it's not just across <laughs> Asia, maybe it's uh, 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 elsewhere in the world as well. But, um, um, uh, um, but, but, but um, Jeremy and Rich have, you know, sort of taken this ancient idea of growing molds on soybeans and growing molds on um, uh, uh, rice and barley you know, and they started growing mold on pork chops and on popcorn. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I mean, to my mind, that's like, you know, that's really interesting that they're, you know, taking this ancient process and applying it to totally new kinds of uh, uh, ingredients. And, and um, you know, yesterday I was visiting my friend, um, you know, in my small town who has a little fermentation business. And, you know, I noticed that the kombucha that they had on tap was a coffee kombucha. And so, you, you know, I mean, I think that, I think it's inevitable that people will continue to, um, you know, to, to, to innovate and to, you know, sort of take these ancient ideas that they're learning and then just apply them in a, in a, in a new way. And I think that, that that's just like a human thing. Like, you know, we, 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 we have this drive to, um, you know, to, to experiment and innovate and learn more.
And I think we will continue to. I know for a fact that large international food companies are paying attention to the fermentation space. Um, there's a lot of investment money going into um, the idea of creating um, meat substitutes or, um, you know, not just growing meat in a lab, but using things such as like mycelial growth or koji or um, using grains and processing grains in different ways to create different textures and flavors. I mean, I know that there's a, you know, people who are looking at the future of the planet and people with money, deep pockets who, who would like to sell some version of what that future is going to be, they're definitely looking at fermentation techniques um, and investing heavily within their, that space. All right, you two, we've, any final thoughts before we sign off? Well, okay, let, 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 I, I just wanna remind people that this is my new book, Fermentation as, as Metaphor. And, um, you know, because we have people from all over the world, I mean, I would just point out that like, in the English language, there's a long tradition of describing um, things as fermenting that are not, you know, foods and beverages that are fermenting. And, and so, you know, it's sort of built into the language because, um, uh, you know, fermentation was always identified by, by the bubbles. Um, um, and the word comes from fervere, which is Latin to boil. Um, you know, in the English language, we have this tradition of talking about, um, um, oh, a period of great musical fermentation, artistic fermentation, political fermentation, cultural fermentation, and um, uh, we've applied it very, very widely. And what I've learned talking to people from other places is it doesn't always translate easily, like not in every language doesn't necessarily um, sort of use the word in that way. But you know that's that's really like the foundation of fermentation as metaphor. It's built into the English language, and um, you know for hundreds of years we've been using fermentation in in really um, um, diverse ways. And so this book is really just a you know an, an exploration of 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 that and uh, and reflection on that. And then just for anyone who doesn't know, my 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 other books, the art of fermentation wild fermentation, and then the sleeper that the fewest people know about, the revolution will not be microwave. Um, so um, I, thank, uh, I thank everybody for, um, for their time and coming today. And I wanna thank Amelia and the others uh, from the Fermentation Association for, uh, for, for, for hosting us. And of course, um, my wonderful friend, Mara, thank you for uh, stimulating conversation, Mara, as always. <laughs> Yes, thank you to the Fermentation Association and for everybody who showed up. I got to spend an hour with one of my favorite people. <laughs> thank you so much to all of you for attending today's webinar. And thank you to Mara and to Sandor. And we also wanted to thank uh, Sandor's book publisher. Fermentation is Metaphor is the book. Chelsea Green published his book. So thank you to his publisher. Um, we received a lot of really great, great questions. We did not have time to get to all of them. I know Mara is very active on her Instagram. Um, I'm sure she'd be happy to answer questions there. And Sander is very active on his website on the forum board of Wild Fermentation. Um, we will also be report, posting a recording uh, of their conversation today on TFA's website in the next 24 hours. We also have a number of great webinars coming up in the next few weeks including Introduction to Hassa with Charlie Kalish and the new taxonomy of lactobacillus with Michael Ganzel. Uh, please go to fermentationassociation.org to check these out and to register. And while you're there, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Again, thank you all for joining us today. Bye everyone.